Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. We are looking forward to sharing one size doesn't fit all, contextualizing credit and insurance in low and middle income countries. But first, let's start with some introductions. My name is Tyler Spencer, and I'm a policy manager for the finance sector at JPOW Global, based at MIT. And I will hand this over to Kim. Thanks, Tyler. My name is Kim Cole, and I'm the initiative director of We Define at the BRAC Institute of Governance and Development. I'll hand the floor over to Leonie. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. My name is Leonie Rawls. I work with Tyler at JPAL Global in Cambridge, um, and I'm a senior policy associate on JPAL's agriculture sector. So today, we'll be unpacking evidence on effective approaches to tailoring credit and insurance to local contexts. First, we'll discuss limitations to the traditional microcredit model and how to adapt microcredit to meet women's needs. Then we'll explore adapting microcredit for small scale farmers, which is an essential task given that three quarters of the world's poor are involved in agriculture and play a large role in, in addressing rising food insecurity around the globe. Lastly, we'll consider how other financial products like insurance can work in tandem with credit to alleviate other constraints like risk that farmers face. We'll conclude with presenting a tailored risk management solution for female pastoralists. Our main message here is that financial products like credit and insurance need to be carefully tailored to different contexts to increase their effectiveness. We will share rigorous evidence on what works and what has not worked in order to promote evidence-informed policymaking. I'll hand it over now to Kim. Thanks, Leonie. I'll share a bit of background on BIGD. We're the BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, and we're a social science research and academic institute based in Dhaka, Bangladesh, with a mission to improve governance and development outcomes. We conduct rigorous multi-methods research to evaluate practical innovations for tackling government and development challenges. We also lead the research on the socioeconomic empowerment programs of BRAC, including their ultra-poor graduation program, microfinance, and climate change programs. Now, We Define is an initiative of BIGD that supports rigorous research on digital finance and women's economic empowerment in the Global South. Several factors make We Define unique, First, we prize mixed methods research, and we aim to level the competitive playing field for academics that are often excluded in the competitive funding process. In this way, We Define seeks to establish a strong Southern voice in the global, global policy discourse. Over to you, Tyler. Thanks, Kim. At JPAL, we conduct randomized evaluations to answer some of the complex questions around poverty. Our affiliated researchers try to understand the conditions and causes of poverty, and then tailor solutions to tackle these problems. We fund new cutting edge research in each of the 10 sectors that we work in, and we have policy experts that know how to adapt research findings and distill them into advice and guidance for governments, NGOs, foundations, and others seeking to make their programs more effective and backed by rigorous evidence. In addition, we also provide online and in-person education programs with a focus on data and evidence use in policymaking. These three pillars are closely interconnected and cyclical. Innovative research generate important policy insights and trainings are designed to lead new policy relevant research. To open up the conversation, I want to share a bit about microcredit and our theory of change. In essence, it describes how we think microcredit can lead to better outcomes if it works. The idea here, as many of you are probably familiar with, is that increased access to credit can lead to greater business investment by micro entrepreneurs who are looking to either start new businesses or expand and improve their current business. If firm owners are able to make investments in capital and labor, then we might expect that they are able to increase their revenue and hopefully this, their profits. If they're making more money, then we might also have more money to take home and spend on investments such as health and education. Though in, real, in the real world, this is not exactly how it always plays out. Before we get into the deviations from the theory of change, I wanna briefly go over the classic microcredit model. The traditional model was designed to address a lot of the issues that prevented lending institutions from expanding their services to those who needed it. And some of these challenges included a lack of information, high screening costs, 
and the high risks of borrowing. Many microfinance institutions and microcredit products share these common traits, including group lending, which basically means that group members are jointly responsible for each other's loan repayment and guarantee those loans. And this means that borrowers might feel more pressured to repay their loans so as not to let their peers down, so to speak. Group lending can also involve a peer screening process, which helps the financial institution gather some information on its borrowers in a low cost way. Uh, immediate repayment and high repayment frequency so as to instill some fiscal dis discipline among borrowers and to reduce the risk of lending to the financial institution. These products were meant to be used for businesses purpose purposes and most of them are targeted towards women. There are seven seminal randomized evaluations across four continents on the impacts of the classic microcredit model. This table visualizes the impacts on a set of indicators that represent our theory of change as we move down the rows. To summarize what's going on here, we see that a, there is a smattering of positive impacts across the board, but no single country shows the entire theory of change. There is no clear pattern for any specific outcome. You may also notice that none of the seven studies found significant impacts on borrowers' household, borrowers household income on average. Digging deeper though, some researchers began to look at how the impacts vary between the different kinds of borrowers. Through meta and follow-up analyses of some of our older microcredit studies, we see that it's only the larger pre-existing already profitable businesses who are achieving higher profits in those original seven studies. j most recent evidence synthesis on microcredit highlights three important improvements to this model. The first is how loan products can be modified to account for the unique challenges that women may face in certain contexts. Second, as mentioned, businesses that were already profitable benefited the most. So what is the impact of targeting high potential entrepreneurs? And last, what is the impact of increasing repayment flexibility or extending the grace period of a loan? Today, we'll focus solely on addressing social pressures for women. So you have to read j microcredit policy insight to learn more about the others. The first point is on how micro, the impacts of microcredit can be different for women specifically. To provide some motivation and context for our discussion, early on researchers began to note that capital wasn't having as strong of an impact for women as it was for men. From some of the studies that provided a capital infusion to micro entrepreneurs, men were making higher returns than women were. But then a reanalysis of three studies, including some of the early wave microcredit, found that the return to, cap to investments for, that men and women borrowers made were actually quite similar. So it wasn't that women were making poorer investment choices. Something else is going on here. To help us understand this scenario, we can think of women and, men, women and men as having two options around what they invest in. They can invest in their own enterprise or in another opportunity within the household. But when taking a closer look at the data, researchers revealed that capital directed towards women entrepreneurs was often allocated to other household enterprises. And so even if on the surface level, we, we're seeing no impact of capital on profits of their own enterprises, we can see that women receiving these finances can actually be increasing the earnings of household within their investments and spending decisions. To say this differently, the pattern we're seeing is that in cases where women in the household where they're was also a male enterprise, they actually made less than the women who owned the sole enterprise within their household. And so we can arrive at the main point of this motivation, which is that women often use their resources, including the proceeds of their loans, to invest in household opportunities beside their own business, potentially reflecting social pressures they may uniquely face to share capital with other members within their household. In one example, to address the issue of household pressure on sharing money, in this intervention, money was instead directly deposited into a privately held mobile money account, while a comparison group received the cash similar to what you see in a typical microcredit. The women in the group that received the money digitally increased their profits by 15%, the value of their business by 11%, their household income and consumption also rose. The researchers in this study did some qualitative research among the participants also, which revealed that those who benefited the most from the loan reported that having the mobile money account alleviated, to share, alleviated pressure to share the loan with family members, and it also increased the control over their loan. 
What we're seeing here is some evidence that products that tighten women's control of their capital can enable higher returns on that capital of, and, and investments and in their own enterprises. And also is an exciting potential use case as the, the use of digital financial services continues to expand throughout the world. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Leone to share evidence on adapting credit models in the agriculture context. Thanks, Tyler. So in, in addition to women facing a unique set of challenges for engaging with credit, small-scale farmers who make up a large portion of the world's poorest also face unique credit constraints. As Tyler presented strategies to tweak the microcredit model to better support women, our research similarly finds strategies to adapt credit models to better support the needs of small-scale farmers. To begin, there are a number of reasons why lenders might not offer credit to smallholders. Farmers may not be an appealing client to lenders. Often based in isolated and rural geographies, farmers are spread out and hard to reach. This makes them intrinsically more expensive for MFIs than customers in urban areas. Therefore, they likely also don't have credit histories. If farmers have trouble accessing credit, they'll need to save to finance their investments, which is difficult because their income is lumpy. What I mean by this is that it primarily comes only once or twice a year at the harvest time. So farmers may not have enough cash when they need to make purchases during the growing season. This can make it difficult for farmers to invest optimally in productivity enhancing agricultural technologies or practices. And I'll share more about a farmer's unique income structure in the next slide. But just to continue on some other constraints, if farmers are able to access credit, often the design of credit products keeps them from utilizing it effectively. For example, many farmers may lack collateral needed for a loan. And lastly, farmers may not have the necessary financial literacy to feel comfortable taking out loans. So due to these factors, few self-sustaining agricultural credit models have emerged. And now to dive into some research from the JPL network. A review of nine randomized evaluations that expanded access to standard credit products for small-scale farmers in low and middle-income countries showed that a majority of farmers, upwards of two-thirds, did not utilize new sources of credit when they were offered to them. Across all four of these studies up here on the slide, although the products and timings differed slightly for the credit products, farmers had to repay the loan to the lender relatively quickly, and they were also characterized by group lending. These are two of the factors that Tyler had explained as limitations to the traditional microcredit model. So for example, in the Morocco study, loans were offered in rural villages within groups of three to four individuals who were held responsible to pay back for each other if someone was unable to pay. And as we can see, there's this mismatch between microcredit borrowing terms and farmers' actual credit needs, which dampens farmers' interest in using these credit products, resulting in low take-up rates. I want to dive a little deeper into farmers' unique income structure, as it affects how to tailor a credit product to an agricultural setting. As indicated by this graph, you can see farmers' incomes are lumpy, as I had mentioned, primarily at the harvest time. To reiterate, this happens once or twice a year, depending on the variety of the crop that's being grown and the number of planting seasons per year. I want to walk through the challenges when income isn't timed to when farmers need to make investments. So first, in the absence of credit or storage solutions, farmers will sell most of their crops at the harvest to bring in much needed cash but generally they'll need to make investments during the planting or the growing season. And by then farmers may have depleted their harvest time windfalls. In addition to this challenge, prices fluctuate within the season, especially in contexts where markets are poorly integrated, prices can be very, very responsive to changes in local supply. Prices will tend to be lowest immediately after the harvest when farmers are flooding the market, and then tend to peak before the next harvest. This means that farmers are often selling the bulk of their output when prices are at their lowest. So compounding this mismatch, 
small scale farmers are often not only producers, but also consumers. So they'll consume their own output right after the harvest, but it's not uncommon for them to need to buy additional grain later in the season once their stores are depleted and when prices are again often at their highest and farmer income is at its lowest. So given farmers' unique circumstances and income structure, how can we make credit work for smallholders? We, research we've reviewed at JPAL finds two different strategies to do this. These learnings are supported across nine randomized evaluations and summarized in JPAL's policy insight on credit, which we have linked at the end of the presentation and encourage you all to take a look at. The first strategy is to time contracts around a farmer's cash flow. And the second is to tailor credit products using flexible collateral arrangements. In the interest of time, I'm going to dive into a quick case study to demonstrate these two strategies in action. So in Kenya, researchers collaborated with the One Acre Fund to design a program to give farmers well-timed access to credit and allow them to make, be make better use of storage and sell their output at higher prices later in the season. It's important to note in this context, over the six to eight months following the harvest, maize prices may increase as much as 50%. So this is an opportunity for farmers to take advantage of price fluctuations. In this study, farmers could take out loans immediately after the harvest to be repaid nine months later. In addition, they were offered bags to store their maize and then use that maize to serve as loan collateral to borrow money at the harvest. And the timing of this credit meant that farmers were no longer cash constrained and could hold onto the grain as prices rose. Take up of this product was relatively high. 71% of farmers took up the post-harvest loans. So providing timely access to credit allowed farmers to purchase at lower prices and sell at higher prices actually increasing farm profits and generating a return on investment of 28%. So this is an example of a well-designed credit product for an agriculture setting. As we can see from this case study, when tailored to the agricultural context, it's possible that credit can boost small scale producers' income. However, a broader review of rigorous evidence suggests this isn't always the case. You can see on the slide, for example, in Mali, credit helped farmers increase their farm outputs, but th this did not lead to an increase in their profits, demonstrating that credit isn't the only constraint that farmers are facing. At JPAL, we think of farmers facing a myriad of constraints, and we've grouped our evidence into seven factors that limit agricultural technology adoption. These include risk, as I've walked through, as well as, uh, sorry, I mean credit that I've walked through, as well as risk, information, inputs and outputs, externalities, labor, and also land. So we encourage anyone to follow up with questions on these productivity constraint areas. But specifically risk is one of the factors that people familiar with the agricultural context often think of as being in tandem with credit. So I'm going to provide some background on why risk is a unique and important constraint for farmers. Why do we care about risk? Farmers can face risk from many sources, but they're often extremely exposed to weather and climate shocks. Even if farmers are able to get credit that's tailored to their needs and are able to make an investment, they won't necessarily be able to pay it back if adverse weather wipes out their crops. If they don't have access to strategies to ensure against or mitigate their exposure to weather-based risk, then choosing to increase their investments in crops or technologies, both of which are known to be key to increasing their profits, would appear to be an unsafe gamble. So at JPAL, we have a review of evidence that's similar to the one on credit that looks at interventions which aim to help farmers overcome weather-based risk. Many of these findings are focused on insurance, um, and we've linked this as well at the end of the presentation. However, similarly to credit, there is low demand for insurance as a commercial product. For now, I'm going to hand over to Kim to share a case study on contextualizing insurance to support women pastoralists. 
Thanks, Leonie. Today, I will be sharing a case study on one redefined supported study that has successfully tailored a risk management solution to speak to the needs of a specific population with promising results. This study is a multi-arm RCT led by researchers at UC Davis, IFPRI, and the BOMA project in Northern Kenya. This RCT tests whether digital livestock insurance in conjunction with insurance subsidies can protect the assets built by women through an ultra poor graduation program. Ultimately, this study seeks to measure the impact of these interventions on women's economic empowerment. But today we will focus on this team's innovative and effective approach to tailoring a risk management solution specifically to pastoral women vulnerable to climate change. Let's take a closer look. As Leonie mentioned, one challenge with credit and insurance products in low and middle income countries is very low take up. Traditionally, livestock insurance is framed around the interests of the individuals tending the animals. And in these communities in Kenya, men tend to the livestock while women work in the home. But when rangeland crisis hits, women and children also indirectly suffer. Acknowledging this reality, the research team developed a video game modeled on the popular Sims game to reframe the merits of insurance in a way that links livestock welfare directly to women's risks and responsibilities, termed family framing. When piloted, family framing doubled women's demand for the product relative to conventional framing. But these results were generated in a hypothetical context. Would, would family framing work in the real world? The research team took their findings to insurance provider, Takaful Insurance Africa, along with a family framing redesigned as a comic book, which you can see here. Takaful agreed to sell the livestock insurance with family framing and in family units, equivalent to the compensation provided under Kenya's Scalable Social Protection Program. In short, the branding and contra contractual terms of the livestock insurance were reformulated in a way that made sense to women. Now this graph represents actual sales data from the insurance provider in the context of the study. Here it is important to note that about half the sample received subsidies on the insurance. What we see is that after the subsidy period ended, individuals who had not received a subsidy spent none of their own money on livestock insurance. Additionally, without a subsidy, family framing had no impact on insurance demand relative to traditional framing. But for individuals who did receive a subsidy, the story is quite different. After the subsidies period ended, family framing increased demand for livestock insurance from 20% up to 30% relative to relative to traditional framing. Additionally, women who received the family framing spent 50% more of their own money on livestock insurance than women who received traditional framing. And all of these results are statistically significant. So what do these findings mean in practice? Well, we can conclude that reframing insurance in ways that speaks to women's interests works to increase women's demand for the product. It is also clear that subsidies on insurance products may be necessary to allow women time to experiment with and learn about an unfamiliar product like insurance. Importantly, women-centric framing and product subsidies when offered in tandem can generate sizable impacts. And more broadly, this example highlights the importance and power of adapting interventions to suit local contexts. While analysis on the extent to which these insurance products protected women's assets is forthcoming, please check WeDefine's website for a working paper analyzing how psychosocial factors shape the impacts of the BOMA Project's graduation program. In conclusion of today's presentation, it is important, particularly for donors and policymakers, 
to understand the limitations of the classic microcredit model, as well as the potential impact of product tweaks. For example, adjusting the mode of loan disbursement can increase women's control of capital, as well as their returns. Additionally, despite innovations in the agriculture context, credit alone may not be enough for farmers. Complementary products that help mitigate risk may be necessary, although low demand remains a persistent problem. And finally, today's case study reinforces the importance of contextualizing interventions. Specifically, the study provides an example of how tailoring products to speak to local interests can address the pervasive issue of low product take-up. We'd like to draw your attention to some of the resources available on our respective websites. Links will be included on the Financial Inclusion Week platform in addition to this YouTube video. Thank you for joining us today, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions.